Farm View with Kieran O'Connor on WLR. Brought to you by GlanviaConnect.com. Hello and welcome to Farm View. Well, as usual, it's Kieran O'Connor here with your weekly farming program. And once again, I have a very busy show for you. This week, on this week's show, I'll discuss the shock revelation that Brazil planned to add 24 million cattle as Ireland plans to cut its national herd. Plus, I visit the Kearsey family farm in Kilmac to hear all about their very successful Frisian Frisian farmhouse ice cream business. And plus, as always, we'll have our farming calendar. Farm View with Kieran O'Connor on WLR. With GlanviaConnect.com. Ireland's biggest online farming shop and more. Well, starting news last week with the news that Brazil was to add 24 million cattle as Ireland planned to cut their herd. Brazil planned to grow its livestock numbers by 24 million over the next 10 years, which is equivalent to 25 times the size of Ireland's total suckler cow production. To discuss this breaking news and real shattering news for a lot of people involved in the industry, we are joined once again from the Irish Farmers Journal by their market specialist, Phelan O'Neill. Phelan, welcome back to the programme. Hello, Karen. How are you? Phelan, the news about Brazil is just staggering when one sits back and look at what the Irish agri sector has been going through over the past year or two and then you hear this breaking news. Yeah, it, it, we find it quite incredible ourselves, Karen. whenever we come on this report uh, last week. It's produced by the Brazilian Meat Exporters Association, ABIEC, and uh, they're basically outlining this plan that they have, that they will grow the national herd in Brazil by 25 million cattle, uh, as you say, 25 times the size of our suckler herd, and uh, they plan to grow the annual kill of cattle as well by 10 million uh, in 2030 compared to 2020. Now 10 million cattle, I suppose to put that in context, it's the same as five times the total kill in Ireland. I think we hit 1.8 million in uh, in 2019 and just slightly under that last year. So that's more than five times the Irish national kill. The, The reality is Brazil is a very good and capable beef producing country in the world. It's suited to it. They have a good supply of water, good supply of pasture and as they meet the exporters in Brazil will point out that's outside of the Amazon rainforest but that's another and a separate debate on something we flagged up as well. point from this is and, and again this is where we would draw on United Nations research. In Ireland and in Europe in general under the farm to fork strategy we have this ambition of reducing the emissions to the extent that we're going to reduce our production. The EU have put a number on it. They've said we'll produce 15% less beef in the European Union. You know in Ireland we're developing the National Strategic Plan at the minute and there has been a debate there as you know about uh, how we will achieve that will it be calving hairs, will it be reducing hairs, will it be whatever and we're having this debate at it and, and we produce beef in this part of the world in Western Europe with one third of the carbon footprint that it takes in Latin America, that it takes in South America so the reality is that by not doing it here and by doing it elsewhere then we're making the overall problem worse, it's not as if we can even go back and say in Ireland with our little bit tiny and all as we are, small speck in the whole world of global carbon emissions us doing our little bit there in terms of reducing beef production is actually transferring that elsewhere and making the problem three times worse. So it fails on an all reasonable test. When you think of the EU strategy about the common agricultural policy, all built on the whole area of environment, emission, sustainability, this really is just unbelievable when, when one thinks the hoop and loops that are facing the Irish agri sector as we speak. Absolutely. The other thing that we have to remember as Irish farmers is that we have to go and make huge huge improvements in terms of reducing the emissions of our output. It's not enough for us to sit back and say, well, look, this is what's happening elsewhere in the world. We can put our feet up here and do nothing. We're okay. We're not. We can do, we can still make currently three times better than what it is in South America. We can still get better again. We can get better in terms of having cows and calves every year, in terms of reducing our age of slaughter, in terms of efficiencies, driving that on farm. Irish farmers can make improvements within the structure that's there and I think that's the important thing. We can maintain or even marginally increase our output in the in the beef sector and indeed the dairy sector because there we have higher yielding cows all the time. So there is no doubt that there's so much we can do here to make it better and we cannot sit back as Irish farmers and say, oh well look we have nothing more to do, this is uh, this proves it all. It's not. The wider thing then that the Irish government has to focus on and the rest of the European Union has to focus on and there's an opportunity coming up now in Glasgow when the world gets together again to discuss the whole issue of climate change. The reality is that the level of emissions in Asia, North America and indeed then the ambitions that is in Brazil for growing their herd, we have to have a total global approach to this and there's no point in just sitting 
Britain back and say, look, Ireland will do its bit and then everything else will be all right. The reality is it's not as if Ireland has a climate or is yeah, an atmosphere that we're responsible for. It's one world, one atmosphere, and there has to be one plan to deal with. Now, as regards, we knew the problem 10 years or so ago as regards the whole beef imports into the EU and now with Brexit, of course, and Britain and the UK standing out of the EU and, and that whole area. As regards a level playing field, is that going to be a problem as regards markets going forward? Well, look, in terms of, of markets and, and the wider trade space, uh, Kieran, the reality is that there's a deal, a trade deal agreed between the European Union and uh, Mercosur, the umbrella organisation that covers the, the major South American countries. Uh, that's there to grant na- uh, access for an extra 99,000 tonnes of beef. The other thing in then, and uh, the new player, or the new entrant to, to the game is the United Kingdom, who are right now making their own trade deals. Uh, we have seen recently the deal that they concluded with Australia gives them effectively an open door for beef and sheep meat exports. They're at the very close to concluding a deal with New Zealand as well, and we expect it to be more of the same. They have also, the, the UK ambassador to Uruguay would have indicated a few weeks ago there that they're amenable to even opening a trade negotiation with separate members of the Mercosur group. So look, the reality is from a trade perspective, Kieran, uh, we have the EU on the point of granting increased access, but we're also going to experience more disruption perhaps from the tr- from the trade deals that the UK makes than what the European Union makes because that is our primary market for so many of our exports. And uh, if they're having an open door in terms of sheep meat access, beef access, etc., then that, that is something that would be of big concern. Maybe not this year, maybe not even even next year, but certainly in the medium time and in the second half of this decade, I feel that we'll be uh, feeling the impact of that in a major way. The whole area of Origin Green and sustainability in Board B are doing super work globally as regards looking at new markets, particularly uh, following on from the Brexit debacle. As regards the Irish farmers, but Irish farmers have, and you mentioned what needs to be done, but a lot of farmers have embraced and are embracing what needs to be done as regards protected urea, uh, water quality, biodiversity, trailing shoe as regards spreading a slow and sorry, a lot of good work going on, but a lot more to be done, obviously. And, and this is something that we can never stand still on. We always have to aim to be better. And I think that's the narrative that we need to try and encourage our government and our agencies to focus on. Focus on further improvement. We're a lot better than we were 20 years ago. We're a lot better than we were 10 years ago. Uh, we have that origin green place now for over a decade. We're measuring the, emis- the, the output from our farm. Like, we're measuring. We're checking all of this. We can get better again. And I think that's where we need to try and switch the debate to, as opposed to having this simplistic emotional debate and say, well look, if we could reduce the Irish uh, livestock herd by whatever number you want to choose, then that would be a major contribution. The reality is, it's not. We have a whole economy outside of agriculture. We have our transport emissions, we have our building emissions, we have the wider energy space and the demands that are there on electricity and the concerns coming into this winter, whether we can furnish that. So there's a big whole debate there and I think we have to try and steer the narrative away that there's a simple solution here, folks, cut the national uh, livestock herd and the problem solved. It's not. We can cut the herd and the consequences of wiping out uh, agriculture for farmers, uh, particularly in the areas of the country that are, don't have all major alternative employment opportunities. We can do that, but the reality is we have done nothing of use to solve the problem and that's what we would urge government to think about when they're putting the strategic plan together. As regards the common agricultural policy and I know our Minister has, has laid out the proposal that will go to the EU early next year how hopefully you that we can reach a lot of these targets or do you feel there's a, lot of, there's a huge amount of work still to be done to get that over the line? Again the, the consultation process has been less than satisfactory from a farmer's point of view Correct, in yeah. fact some of the farmers that have contacted us in the Farmers Journal would question whether there's a consultation at all. Uh, the town hall meeting for it, um, it didn't certainly give farmers the opportunity to make the contribution that they would in normal times. Now, of course, we have to be uh, uh, acknowledged that we're operating within the constraints of the pandemic that are still very much there. It's not possible to have the, the major meetings that we might have had in the past. But look, the reality is what has been discussed so far hasn't clarified anything. It has really probably served to confuse and maybe to alarm uh, farmers more than it has uh, than it mm. has comforted them. Having said all that, it's still the end of August. We don't have to have this ready to submit to Brussels until the end of the year. So we have a few months yet that we, if we can concentrate our minds and focus on it, then we, we can get that plan put together. But we do need to certainly get, get working hard on it now. As, uh, summer holidays are over effectively at the at the end of this week now, at the end of August. Uh, you know, things get back into action again in September. And I think if we do put our minds to it over September, October, November, and in the lead up to Christmas, then we can get an awful lot done. But it does require, and it's going to require leadership and input from the the farm organisation
information from the department and to have an, a, a path or outline head that can deliver some realistic benefits, right. not something that works and we can sit back and say in Ireland, we have done our bit now, lads, isn't that great? It's not. Ireland doing this bit on its own is useless and pointless. Uh, what we need to do is get the improvements in place that we can get in place and then get working to build the alliances globally that can develop a pattern and a structure that will tackle the what is a global problem on a global basis. Philip O'Neill, obviously devastating news from an Irish point of view, but obviously with this whole area of the uh, Brazilian deforestation in the Amazon and what's happening down there, in the end it could turn out to be a positive for Ireland if we look after our own house, keep it in order from an EU point of view, produce the quality sustainable food, which I think people are more and more going to be looking for. Indeed, and, and you know, it's, it's something we flagged up in the journal last week as well, the Brazilian government's uh, own agency that monitors the, the Amazon forest like in uh, last year, I think there was an area cleared the size of uh, the entire uh, county, Galway and County Mayo put together two of Ireland's largest counties. That's something, and again, the Brazilian meat industry would distance themselves from that completely. They would say they work within the existing pasture base of the country, which is less than 18% of the mm-hmm. land. But the reality is, if they're clearing an area of rainforest, then you know that land will have to get used for something in time, otherwise they wouldn't be doing it. Hey, put yourselves in the Brazilian shoes for a minute here, of course. They, they can quite easily say to us in the, in the developed world that Look, you know, in Europe, you cleared your land of the of its woodland uh, four or five hundred years ago. Mm-hmm. Uh, you removed that natural vegetation. Uh, you've developed your economies to the point that you have. And you know, are are we not entitled to do the same here? But if we look at this and again take the global view, if, if the Amazon is described as it is the lungs of the world uh, in this age and era, then it falls, I think, on us to look at the support that needs to be given to Brazil, and that would cost us money. But I think mm-hmm. that is the deal that if we're serious about tackling climate change and reducing emissions on a global level and we require Brazil to take certain procedures and policies and put them in place that restricts their capacity for economic development well then we have to be realised that someone's going to have to pay for that. Phil O'Neill, market specialist as always from the Irish Farmer Journal Film. thanks for that insight into this uh, breaking news that we've had of Brazil to add 24 million cattle as Ireland plans to cut our herd here. Phil O'Neill, thanks for talking to us. Thank you Karen. Farm View with Kieran O'Connor on WLR. With GlanviaConnect.com. Thousands of products in the palm of your hand. And you will come back to part two of Farm View. Now, before I speak to the Kiersey family about their very successful freezing, freezing farmhouse ice cream let's have a look at some items from our farming calendar first of all turning as usual to our farmer markets and country markets brilliant local farm fresh products available every week across the city and county this saturday morning wafford farmers market john robert square tremor farmers market priest road tremor and also of course on saturday morning strably farmers market every saturday morning from 10 until 1 sunday is lismore farmers market castle avenue lismore from 10 until 4 while also on sunday with the ardmore farmers market just off the beach car running from 11 until 3 thursday as always, Dungarvan Farmers Market Hive of Activity every Thursday, Grattan Square from 9 until 2. While on Saturday mornings, we've Dungarvan Country Markets back at the Causeway Tennis Club in Abbeyside. And also in the city, we've Wofford Farmer Markets in St. Olaf's Hall every Friday from 9 until 1. On the show jumping front, the very successful Shanachill House Equestrian Centre Summer Leagues continue this Friday night, with the finals now taking place on Friday of next week, the 3rd of September. So great activity down there and huge excitement about next week's final. And finally, for dairy farmers, a reminder again that the big Moor Park open days take place this Tuesday the 14th to Thursday the 16th of September. Over three days this year we'll have more details on next week's program but put those dates in your diary. Farm View with Kieran O'Connor on WLR. With GlanviaConnect.com Ireland's biggest online farming shop and more. Well, one of the great success stories over the last few years County Warford has been Friesian Friesian. It's the artisan ice cream remade down here in Ballyhussa Farm just outside Kilmac and earlier in the week I got a chance to travel down to the Kiersey Farm and talk to two of the main principals involved and that's Ivan Kiersey and Tom. First of all Ivan you must be delighted with the success of Friesian Friesian. Yeah absolutely you know it's, it's been a, a three year project now at this stage. Uh, we started it in 2018 with really the idea in mind was to bring you know, some sort of value add product to the fresh high quality milk that we're producing Right. here at Osa Farm so we landed on ice cream anyway and um, what we did was bring the ice cream to food festivals and food markets initially and then when the Covid kind of closed those things that avenue down so we moved into the retail product the tubs of ice cream Now getting the idea is one thing to bring it to 
to fruition and indeed help and support. You had a concept. Where did you go for help initially? So we would have gone to the local enterprise office. Breed Kirby helped us out hugely at the start in just getting the business started and we've used them along the way for um, different consultancy and uh, some of the information talks they've had are brilliant help for any local business, um, whether they're new or old. We also used innovation grant from the Enterprise Ireland so that was a great help in, in the research and development, produ- getting the product up, up What's and going, special basically. about Friesen Friesen? Uh, obviously you got the help, you were ready to start off. What's the unique selling point here? I think it's, uh, you know, we're using the fresh milk from our cows. We're all about the uh, freshest local produce, all natural ingredients, no artificial preservatives, emulsifiers and we're also actually making a lot of the inclusions that we put in the ice cream here on site, so our, your brownie and honeycomb, lemon curd meringues, they're, they're all produced here as well, so it's now, a real farm to spoon. Three involved is yourself, Ivan, there's David and your brother Tom. <laughs> Difficult to get three brothers on the one page. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I suppose look, it was something that we just bought into early on, and it, it's been a, a family effort all the way through. Even though we're the three that get the, right. the main coverage of it, but it, it really is a family effort. As regards the dairy farm, I, I, I'll come back to you on it. You were brought up in the dairy farm. Was dairy farming always going to be the life for Ivan? Yeah, I think so. I think I had the vogue from early on, and uh, yeah, it wasn't a, a hard decision right. for me to come back farming. Now, turning to the man himself, Tom, I believe you are the main man when it comes to production of the ice cream. Learning the skills and getting the equipment how difficult was that and how long did it take for you to get the art of making ice cream yeah I suppose like uh, like Ivan was saying we got lots of support from, from Leo in terms of setting up the business but we also got support um, from Enterprise Ireland their innovation vouchers which we would have worked with Moore Park down in, in Fermoy and that was a great help just for us too we had the I suppose the initial concept for the ice cream the recipe that really would have we would have grown up with with our, our mum making ice cream for us and um, which kind of set the stall for us going the ice cream route um, was a bit of trial, trial and error. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. I suppose we started off with the rolled ice cream. Um, so that recipe was developed to allow us to have the liquid ice cream on the the kind of flash ice pan, and that was really good. We started off with that, worked with more park, and then obviously over COVID, like Ivan was saying, we we had to alter the recipe to make it sellable in tubs and get them out to stores and then the retail stores that we're in at the moment. No, obviously it's a very intricate process. You might tell our listeners we're here in the beautiful little plant, the plant you have down here in in Valley Hustle. So the milk comes directly down from the dairy parlour. Yeah, so so we get the milk fresh from the from the bulk tank. You know, on, on any day that we're we're producing the ice cream. So that's step one, and then we we I suppose we mix it in with the other uh, I suppose ingredients in the ice cream mix into the pasteurizer. Um, so it's a clean a clean product with only with only five kind of core ingredients. Right. Um, so it's pasteurized, it's brought up to. to to, to over 74 degrees and then cool to 5 degrees we then age it the second step is aging the, the ice cream um, and how long does that take the aging that's, the aging is about 12 to 24 hours okay. yeah so so day one would be would be making the ice cream and Tom the ingredients so the, or is that the secret of, of uh, the no no not, not really I suppose look like Ivan was saying we, we like to keep it as clean label as possible you know no artificial preservatives or, or emulsifiers so it, it's just a, the, the simple recipe really is cream you know the milk obviously from the farm cream dextrose sugar and milk's right. bean gum and and egg and that's it you know all like I said it's all, all natural and clean the various flavours then obviously there's a platter of flavours available but you have you four or five very distinctive flavours we do yeah yeah we do um, um, I suppose the ones that we, we again the test bed for us as a business was the the markets that we used to go to the likes of West Waterford the likes so of these food festivals were real bloaty when when they were disbanded with COVID it was yeah no it was obviously that was where we initially yeah. started and like I said it was brilliant brand brand building and even for us getting to know what people the, the flavours that people love um, obviously when COVID hit then that all you know went to the floor but that again again kind of gave us the opportunity to, to rethink and say look we need to move into the retail space how difficult <laughs> was that now you're up and running what type of support have you got in that I suppose it was a lot of lockdown uh, activities yeah exactly yeah well not really we were all we were all down here at, yes. the, at the farm over lockdown so the plant that we're in at the moment you know I suppose that was converted into a food grade facility over lockdown but I suppose we had our first uh, tubs into store in October so it was around a I suppose a, a six month good. period of getting it right for us and um, support locally has been good in Waterford yeah it's been really really good yeah we're in you know seven or eight stores in Waterford 
board um, whether it's cafes or, or the likes of Ardkeen uh, Coach House Crew Casting Co and Chips and then Azoro in Dunmore yeah and the Cliff House so in Ardmore so great so. spread across from Dunmore to Ardmore Dungarvan Casting Co exactly Ardkeen yeah, Stones, yeah, yeah. and a few more in between um, and response has been good really really good yeah the local response has been has been excellent I think people resonate with the fact that you know we are local and, and everything you know as I've been saying is taking place on the farm so no we're delighted with it so far and I must say it's real state of the art you've done a fabulous job with the facility the stainless steel the beautiful shiny floor the beautiful white white walls it's real state of the art so you had the time to put that together during lockdown yeah we did we did indeed yeah and it, like I said it, it took some time but we're really happy with where it is at the moment um, and it's it's you know like you see you, you can see it's, it's it's small and it's micro but that's the way we are that's where we are so at, next move at obviously on to the restaurants and hotels yeah I suppose it's something that we're looking at at the moment we, we have been concentrating on, on the retail getting the tub right you know we're really happy with the design and the feedback has been really good mm-hmm. getting into food service is something that we will look into down the line but again if we're kind of incrementally growing Brilliant. like that yeah. yeah. Ivan turning to you the last time I spoke to you down here you mentioned about the robots you've got involved in the robots how many robots do you have and what type of herd do you have you presently in Ballyhusa yeah so we're milking um, 135 pedigree Frisians so we've been pedigree Frisians here for, for as long as I remember and I think for, for a same my dad as well back generations yeah, absolutely yeah so they're, they're here longer than us even I'd say but um, we installed two robots then in 2017 here to, to milk the cows and essentially the cows come in to milk themselves we've two robot stalls and the robots are open 24-7 and, and we use fresh grass then as the kind of how was the transition the number one and how well has it worked as regards quality and indeed as regards yield yeah so the transition in the first year is, is difficult enough I suppose in getting the cows used to it and, and even getting ourselves used to it there's a, a world of information comes back at you from, from the technology that's in use over there yeah it's so the milk quality is, is excellent now from it and uh, the milk yield has, has grown you know 15-20% so we're very happy with it and definitely the whole ice cream enterprise has really worked seamless for you and you, you've started it off been locked down a bit through COVID but you're ready to expand and, and really hit the ground running now yes exactly so we actually are in the uh, planning route with, with uh, leader grant for further expansion on our machines here to increase the output and, and go down hopefully other avenues as Tom Listen, was it's, it's a fantastic success story I'm glad to see three brothers coming together and three years later still together but Ivan yourself Tom and, and David but Tom in particular down in the production unit well done it looks fabulous it is fabulous and I'm thrilled to know that the businesses the retail business right across the city and county have been supportive and best to look I know the hotels and restaurants won't be found wanting but listen well done you're keeping up a great family tradition and the um, Kearsies and Frisians go back a long way and I'm sure your late granddad will be very proud of what you've achieved here thanks for talking to me Ivan and Tom thanks very much Karen. thanks very much Karen. and before I go as always on a racing front a good week again for local Waterford Connections Cross Channel great week for Waterford local jockeys Dungarver Jock Nile Hulan had a nice winner at Newtown Abbott while Kappa Jock Tom Queeley was in the winner's enclosure at Lingfield and again at Yarmouth back home a good period again at Killarney for local trainer Sean Ahern was in the winner's enclosure at Killarney as was Nakeen Butlerstown trainer Henry De Brahma. so a good week all round for local connections at home and indeed cross channel as well well that's it for this week's programme once again my thanks to Sean and Ollie for all their help in putting this week's programme together so stay safe keep up the protocol and I'll talk to you same time next week Farm View with Kieran O'Connor on WLR with glanviaconnect.com thousands of products in the palm of your hand